Hey, what's up, everybody? Great to see you guys. Thanks for coming out this weekend. I want to welcome, uh, welcome those of you that might be joining us online. It's so cool that we get to do this all, all together. And I've been praying that God would do some really uh, unexpectedly cool things in our hearts today. Uh, I know it's uh, like the baseball playoffs are going on. Dodgers and the Cubs are going at it right now. Uh, but come on, it's football season, right? It's football season. And I, you know, I, I, I debated about wearing the Packers air, this jersey because every time I put it on, people are always coming up to me going, are you Aaron Rodgers? Because we're both like right-handed. That's, that's the only thing we got in common. But this, uh, you know, it is football season. Right now, Friday night lights are going on at every high school campus around the country. And, you know, tailgating parties are happening on college stadiums around the country. And the NFL's Sunday morning. The NFL is on Sunday afternoon, Sunday night. Monday night, Thursday night, I mean, the NFL is just all, always on. Uh, anybody in fantasy leagues where you're kind of managing all your fantasy teams and players and stuff like that? Yeah, from now until February, we're, whether you like it or not, you're going to see these chiseled gladiators going at it on the gridiron uh, until the Super Bowl happens. So, so we just thought that we ought to, since we're in this season, just call a little time out and do what those guys that wear the striped shirts do. And maybe just kind of go under the hood, so to speak. Go to the replay monitor and just take a closer look at how our character is growing. Uh, We just thought it it might be be a good idea for us to ask God, God, what do you you see? After further review, what, what do you see in there? And you need to know, whenever we do something like this, God is for us in this process. And the other great thing is, he always makes the right call. He's never blown one in his life. And I was thinking how God has, uh, man, he's thrown a flag on me throughout my life for various things. Like I've been, I've been flagged numerous times for unsportsmanlike conduct. Anybody else? You know, when your tongue gets a little out of control, you say things you wish you hadn't have said. And I've, I've been flagged for uh, like blocking the back uh, where I gossiped about somebody or criticized someone behind their back. I've been flagged for holding on to things I should not be holding on to, whether it's the past or regrets or some resentment in, in my life or some grudges. I've been flagged for uh, encroachment where I got into the neutral zone where I should not be. I should not have got involved in that. I've been, I've been flagged for delay of game uh, because I used to be a world-class procrastinator. And this weekend, uh, as you already saw in the video, a flag has been thrown on unnecessary roughness. Now, you know that football is a violent game. I mean, think about it. There, there's like a collision on almost every play. There is an injury on almost every play. Knees get blown out, fingers get broken, shoulders get dislocated, uh, ankles get sprained, guys get concussions with lasting implications. It is not a game for the weak of heart or body. And that's why I have always loved flag football. (laughs) In in fact, when I was in college, uh, our school was too small. We didn't have a football program. So A bunch of us put together, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, a a traveling squad. And we went around all these other uh, small schools and little towns in central Illinois, and we just played guys in flag football tournaments. And I I found that it was just as fun with half the pain because I ran out of bounds a whole lot. I, I guess you could say flag football was a kinder, gentler version of football. And after further review... That's what I want to be said of me these days. That I'm a kinder, gentler version of the guy I used to be. Because for too, too many years, in, in lots of different ways, I would have been flagged repeatedly for unnecessary roughness. I was way too rough on myself, way too demanding, way too critical of myself. And I could be really, really harsh with other people. I could be pretty uh, sarcastic, biting. I could uh, be pretty blunt, really short with people, way too harsh. So I had to stop, and I had to go to the replay monitor, and I had to ask God to review my life. And I started praying that prayer like we've talked about here, here before from Psalm 139, where you say, search me, O God. 
I, I want you to get under the hood with me, so to speak, and I, I want you to take a look. Is there anything in me that you find offensive? Is there anything you want to throw a flag on me right now in my character? After further review, God, what is it that needs to change on the inside of me? And I started using a little verse in the back of the Bible. It's tucked in a little book called Galatians as kind of a replay monitor, a kind of a checklist to see how my character might be improving. And I started really for the first time in my life, really allowing the Holy Spirit to go to work in me throughout the day. I lived in the awareness of his presence. I always ask him first thing in the morning, as, as I go through my day, remind me, help me hear you when you remind me in the moment to watch my tone and to watch my reactions and to watch my body language and to watch my, watch my tongue. And I tried to listen to him throughout the day as he was trying to speak into my character. Now I've got a long, long way to go. Uh, but hopefully I'm, I'm getting better at each one of those things that I find on that list. And I'm going to show you that list in just a second. But when I first started doing this, the one that jumped off the list at me because I was, felt like God was flagging me for unnecessary roughness was gentleness. I looked at this list, it was like it just jumped off the page. And I thought, you've got to be kidding me, God. Gentleness? Come on. Breezes are gentle. Bambi is gentle. Charmin is gentle. You know, you don't hear the Marines say, we're looking for a few gentle men. The boxing ring announcer never says, let's get ready to fluff pillows. He doesn't say that. We live in a rough and tumble cage match, gridiron on the frozen tundra kind of world. We are American Ninja Warriors. We are men and women who do battle every day with dirty diapers and traffic on the five. We are gladiators. We can't afford to be gentle. Now, my problem used to be, and I think our collective problem is, that most of us just have a misunderstanding of what gentleness actually means. I mean, the word that's used in the Bible for gentle doesn't mean weak. It doesn't mean frail. doesn't mean soft. doesn't mean delicate. It actually means power under control. The term originally came from the equestrian world, and it referred to a horse trainer who would take this young, wild, you know, snorting, bucking bronco of a colt with all that raw energy and all that power, and he would break it. It was power under control. And you, when you really think about it, couldn't we all use a little power under control? I mean, you're walking through the grocery store, and you see this toddler laying on the floor, throwing a temper tantrum. Arms and legs are flailing because her mom won't let her open the Pop-Tarts. What do they need in that moment? A little power under control. When a teenager storms to their room, they slam the door, they crank up the music, and erupt with the kind of emotions that make, like Hurricane Matthew, look like a passing shower. What do they need in that moment? A little power under control. When a grown man blows his top and starts using the kind of language that turns the air blue and everyone's blood cold at the t-ball field, what does he need in that moment? Power under control. And I don't know about you personally, maybe God might be throwing a flag on you for unnecessary roughness. He certainly threw one on me and told me, bro, that's my name, Bro, you know, you know what you need right now? You need some gentleness. I told me I needed some gentleness with my wife. I needed some gentleness with my kids. I told me I needed some gentleness with the people that I worked with and the people I was trying to lead. I told me I needed some gentleness with the players that I was trying to coach and I told me I needed some gentleness with the people I was trying to pastor. And after further review... He was right. Gentleness is exactly what I needed in my life. And if I'm going to be at my very best, and you're going to be at your very best, if our relationships are going to thrive and flourish, we all have to have this power under control. We all need a healthy dose of gentleness. Here's that list I was talking about from Galatians chapter 5. It says, when the Holy Spirit controls your life, and that's the key, when the Holy Spirit of God controls your life, He will produce this kind of fruit in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
I've been using that as kind of the replay monitor to go to and evaluate how I'm growing. I can look at that and go, okay, so how's my love these days? Am I more loving than I was six months ago? How's my joy factor these days? How's my peace and contentment level these days? Am I a faithful person? Am I dependable? Am I trustworthy? Would people look at me and say, that guy's kind. That that guy's good. That guy's gentle. Let me give you a more specific definition of this thing called gentleness. Gentleness is actually your power under God's control. It's your power under the Holy Spirit's control. And there is not a person in this room that doesn't need God's help in this area because everyone who's ever walked this planet has had some rough edges. I mean, I've been walking through the book of Matthew. It's the first book of the New Testament of the Bible. If you're unfamiliar with the Bible, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those first four books of the New Testament are all about the life of Jesus. So I've been taking some guys who are brand new to, 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 to the Bible, some pretty rough guys uh, in Ventura, uh, through verse by verse on Monday mornings. And man, we have learned so much about Jesus. We've learned so much about ourselves. And what's been really cool is we've been reading verse by verse through, this, through the life of Jesus and looking at the guys that hung out with Jesus I mean, more than one occasion we said, that guy's, I mean, he's a lot like me, man. And when you, look at, when you look at the guys that hung out with Jesus for three years, you talk about guys with rough edges? Oh, my word. Get guys like James and John. You know what Jesus nicknamed these two guys? The sons of thunder. You can see in black leather robes with sons of thunder on the back, you know, SOT tattooed on their forearm, riding Harley camels, I, I don't know. But, but one time... <laughs> One time, Jesus and his guys are going to pass through a place called Samaria. They're on their way to Jerusalem. They're going to stop over for the night in a town in this place called Samaria. And there was a little division, not a little division, a big division between Jews and Samaritans at the time. And Jesus and his, and his friends were kind of a hot, controversial topic in that day. And this certain town in Samaria wouldn't let them spend the night. Well, James and John, the sons of thunder, they go ballistic. And they say to Jesus, yo, Jesus, you want us to call down fire from heaven and take these people out? Can you say rough edges? I mean, another guy, you know, that needed a little power under control was a guy named Peter. He was another one of Jesus' closest friends. He had some rough edges. Some of you know about Peter, how he was super impulsive, and he was prideful and boastful, and he was very outspoken. He was always sticking his foot in his mouth. And when, when they came to arrest Jesus in the garden, Peter whips out a sword, starts flailing around and cuts the ear off a servant. It was Peter who denied knowing Jesus three times, even after he said, I'm a tough guy. I would never do that. I would die for you. I would never disown you. The rest of these guys, they might run because they're chickens, but not me. I'm a tough guy. There's no wonder what Jesus said over in Luke chapter 9 how much longer got to put up with you guys? But he saw their potential. He looked past their rough edges. And he knew that if they could get to know him better, if they could hang out with him enough, they could watch him, how he moved, how he related and reacted to people, if they could start depending upon his power and his grace and his compassion, if they would walk in step with the soon coming Holy Spirit, God could change these guys. And that's why he invited them, and he invites us in Matthew chapter 11 when he said, just come to me. Just come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I'll give you rest. Just take my yoke upon you. Just hook up with me. Let me teach you because I am humble and I am what? Gentle. And I'll give you rest for your souls. So here's Jesus saying to us, just come to me. If you just do life with me, hook up with me, I will enable you to have power under my control because that's how God is. God is a gentle God. Now that doesn't mean that God is weak by any stretch of the imagination. Doesn't mean that Jesus was weak when he called himself the gentle one. I mean, I I was thinking about this this week. You know, the pictures we have of Jesus, I just don't think serve us well because think of this. Jesus worked as a carpenter for almost 30 years. Have you guys ever hugged a guy that's worked in carpentry for 30 years? They're like rock hard. And Jesus, back in his day when he was a carpenter, when they ran out of lumber, he didn't run to Home Depot. 
You had to make your own lumber. So he's cutting down trees. He's making boards. You, so you know this guy was strong and he had calloused hands and he was ripped from all the physical labor. I've always thought how that was a cool picture of Jesus. One time when he's standing there in the temple of God and he sees all these religious con artists ripping people off in the name of God in the temple. And Jesus stands there as long as he can take it. And, and there's nostrils begin to flare with the injustice of it all and he starts flipping over tables and he's driving animals out and he's throwing money everywhere i've always thought it was kind of cool like nobody mess with him i mean nobody mess with him he's a strong guy he went toe-to-toe with satan over temptations of great proportion and stayed strong he he, he said some really strong things to religious leaders who were distorting the word of god And Jesus courageously endured the humiliation and the pain of the cross. No weak man does that. You talk about power under control. I think it's there that we see the greatest display of gentleness in the history of our world. Because he could have. He could have called down fire from heaven. He could have called down thousands of angels to rescue him and blow away his accusers. It was all within his power. But in this amazing demonstration of power under control, he carried our sins to the cross because he knew no one else could. You see, without this thing called gentleness, the greatest events in the history of the world would not have occurred. After his resurrection, Jesus told his followers, guys like Peter, James, and John, all those guys with rough edges, that they would receive power when the Holy Spirit would come upon them. And you can read all about it when, in Acts chapter 2. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the book of Acts, the history of the early church. You can read about that, how the Holy Spirit comes upon them and changes these guys, smooths out all their rough edges, and these guys become history makers. I mean, they change the world. Uh, And the good news is that the same power that smoothed the rough edges off of these guys can smooth out yours and mine as well. Now, is it okay? Would it confuse anybody if I mix metaphors here today? If if I took like like football and carpentry and smashed them together, would that be okay? Could you hang with me if I did that? Because those are two of my passions that they both involve rough edges. Um, Some of you know I've been remodeling the junky old house for the past year. I love doing that stuff, took it down the studs, been putting it back together. My skill level may be questionable, uh, but I really love it. I love finishing a day covered in sawdust. And I think my love for that stuff goes all the way back to the seventh grade shop class. Anybody take industrial arts or shop when you were like in middle school? I can remember our teacher, Mr. Reynolds. He would take us along, take us around and show us all the different tools. The first tool he showed us was the, was the planer, the wood planing machine. And I was thinking, as a guy who's got plenty of layers built up in me, what the Holy Spirit wanted to start as he was building this gentleness inside me, he wanted to plane my disposition. He wanted to strip some of those layers off. So I I think some of you might be saying, I I hear you talking about gentleness and stuff, but I got to tell you, bro, it's just just not in my makeup. It's just not me. I'm not tender. I'm not friendly. I'm not funny or laid back. I'm tough. I'm type A, I'm hard charging, I'm highly competitive, I'm aggressive, I'm high energy, I'm pretty outspoken, I just say what's on my mind, that's just my personality, and I've heard you say you're supposed to be true to who God wired you up to be. Well, God's not interested in changing your basic personality makeup. He does want you to be you. He's just really interested in helping you become his best version of you. And that's why God wants to take our unique personality and let it play out through the Holy Spirit. He wants to plane our disposition so that we can act and react and relate to people the way that Jesus did. I had a basketball coach tell me one time, I would never have a player that didn't have a temper, but I would never have one that didn't have it under control. You ought to have some fire in you. You ought to have some passion and and ambition and energy and drive and courage. You were made in God's image. And God possesses all those qualities in a very healthy way. But you know as well as I do, there is an unhealthy flip side to those qualities as well. And unless you and I surrender the dangerous shadow side of those traits of the Holy Spirit, we're just going to turn into these hard-charging, insensitive, irritable, grumpy people who run over other people all the time. I've, I've kept this in my files for years now. It started back when I originally felt like God was throwing a flag on me. 
I read this book by a guy named Gary Smalley. It was, a, it was a book called The Hidden Value of a Man. And I've kept this in my files for, man, over 20 years now. He writes, imagine Clark Kent waking up one morning and somehow forgetting that he possesses superhuman powers. He, snaps, he slaps the snooze button on his clock radio and compresses it to the depth of an index card. At breakfast, he slams his coffee mug down on the table and sends it clean through two inches of splintered mahogany. He yells his frustrations at a sports article in the newspaper and cracks a thermal pane window in the dining room and ruptures his wife Lois's left eardrum. In the hallway, he brushes against Clark Jr., leaving him with a cracked collarbone and a severe concussion. On the way out the door, he swats the cat off his favorite chair and welds the unfortunate animal onto the wallpaper. Leaving the house, he swings the door closed and rips it right off the hinges. He kicks a bicycle off the sidewalk, planting it 50 feet up in the neighbor's elm tree. But that's unrealistic. I mean, how could Superman not realize his own powers? How could he miss seeing the devastation, pain, and havoc he has left in his wake? How could he look at the bruises, the tears, the brokenness, and the chaos and not realize he caused it all? And how could men not realize how powerful they are? How could they fail to comprehend their vast and terrible ability to touch the lives of their families for good or for unspeakable harm? Could you use a little gentleness? The Apostle Paul, who was the guy that wrote most of the New Testament of the Bible, was at one time this out-of-control, powerful dude named Saul, just absolutely running roughshod over people, and Jesus got a hold of him. And God began to change him. He was still tough. He was still fiery. He was still sharp and bold and ambitious. He was a hard worker. He was a very determined guy. But now he channeled all that through the Holy Spirit. And I want you to see what this former tough guy wrote from a prison cell. This is what he said. He goes, I figured it out. Just just rejoice in the Lord always. Let me say it again. Just rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all because the Lord is near. He's saying, listen, Jesus can come back at any time. Life is really, really short. So just live and relate with people in a warm, joy-filled, upbeat, smile in your face, tender kind of way. Gang, we all need to surrender our disposition daily to the Holy Spirit, saying, plane away my moodiness today. Plane away any layers of cynicism that are building up in me. Remind me throughout the day to choose joy even when I don't feel like it. Guard my reactions. Guard my body language today. Help me control my tongue because I don't want to walk around like I'm Superman anymore. When I first got challenged about this, we were living in Las Vegas. And uh, I was there the last couple of days teaching at a church over there. And have you ever had just one of those really like vivid flashbacks that you did not expect at all? Happened to me yesterday. Uh, In between sessions, this guy said, hey, man, I want want to take you over to the house. I want to show you this table that we made. I said, that'd be cool. So we went over to this guy's house. And we we pulled into the garage. And when we pulled into the garage and started to walk into the the house, in in the door that goes from the garage to the kitchen, I, I looked at the door frame and I saw in my mind a nail up there on the left side of that door frame. And here's why I saw it. It was just, it was wild. Maybe it's because I thought, I was thinking about what I was going to talk about today. Uh, back in the early 90s, we were living in Vegas when God was kind of dealing with this gentleness stuff with me. I read an illustration about how guys, now women do this too, but, but guys especially kind of have this, going to go through the day carrying my silver sword, brave heart. I'm going to conquer things and take this hill, and we're going to advance the cause. And, and I was kind of living my life like that. We planted a new church, really, really busy and super, super you know, stressed out about stuff. And uh, so what I had to do, I took a nail, and I nailed it by the left-hand side of that door frame. And every day when I was pulled into the garage, we had little kids, I pulled in the garage, I sit there in the car for a second, I go, okay, God, calm me down, calm me down. I'd get out of the car. I would act like I took my sword out and I would hang it up on that nail. And I would walk through the door and say, fun dad is home. And honestly, what would happen if you just hung your sword up? I mean, if we could just lose the the attitude, right? If we could just lose the harshness, if we could just lose the profanity, 
If we would just lose the you're so stupid roll of the eyes we give people, then our relationship with our, with our spouse, with our kids, with our parents, with our brothers and sisters, our neighbors, our friends, would dramatically improve. Look what it says about the power of gentleness in Proverbs chapter 15. It says, a gentle answer, it has the power to turn away wrath. But harsh words, they stir up anger. So gentleness really is a powerful thing. It can make wrath back up. But harshness is also a powerful powerful thing. And that's why all of us on a daily basis need to surrender to the Holy Spirit our disposition so that he can make us less less rough in our relationships. There's a a second step in doing a woodworking project. And what, what I learned the Holy Spirit wants to do to me once I surrender my basic disposition, he wants to get out the router, and he wants to router my rage. Now, if you're not familiar with what a router does, a router kind of puts a nice edge on a table or a shelf or whatever you're, you're kind of making. It's, it's, it takes the edginess off. And that's what God wanted to do with me. He wanted to take that edge off of me because I can get kind of edgy. And you know what? The Bible is pretty, pretty plain. There's, there's just no room in our lives for unhealthy edginess. There's no room for like angry outbursts. There's no room for rage in our lives. In fact, the verses that precede that checklist, that replay monitor I showed you from Galatians 5 that says, you know, the fruit of the Spirit, when He controls your life, is love, joy, peace, patience, all those things. Well, the verses preceding that is a list of all the flip side qualities that happen in our lives when we don't let the Holy Spirit control our lives. Check it out. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, Then your lives will produce these evil results, sexual immorality, impure thoughts, eagerness for lustful pleasure, idolatry, even participation in demonic activity. And I want you to catch how these these last seven are all rage-related. Hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, divisions, and the feeling that everyone else is wrong except for those in your own little group. Ugly stuff when we don't let the Holy Spirit control our lives. Can I I ask you something about rage? After you've exploded in anger, do you feel better? Or do you just feel stupid? Well, check this out. It says this in Proverbs. Stupid people express their anger openly, but sensible people are patient, and they hold it back. And the really stupid thing is that most of us tend to think when we lose our temper that it's triggered by one of two things. The first are stupid, inanimate objects. You know what I'm talking about? You stub your toe on a couch, you stupid couch. Your computer crashes, you stupid computer. You hit a bad shot, you stupid eight iron, right? We actually call inanimate objects stupid. Like, who's really stupid here? And of course, the second category is stupid people, right? Stupid people. You, you remember that there was a, there was a country comedian a, way, a while back named Bill Ingvall who had a stick about, you ought to hand people a sign that says, I'm stupid. Just hand them the sign. And he would say things like, uh, so I was on the side of the road and I had a flat tire and I was fixing my tire. And, and a guy pulls up and says, got a flat tire? He goes, no, these other three just swelled up all of a sudden. <laughs> he said another time a truck driver got his truck, a semi-truck stuck under an overpass. A cop pulls up and says, get your truck stuck? He goes, no, sir, I was delivering this bridge and just ran out of gas right here. Here's your sign. See, most of us think that it's stupid people who need an I am stupid sign, or it's those stupid things that make us angry. So typically we express our anger going, that that makes me so mad. He makes me so mad. But here's something you will rarely hear come out of the mouth of an angry person. Here it is. I make me so mad. I make me so mad, but I'm going to let you in a little secret. It's true. I make me mad. You make you mad. Because in between the event, whether it's that stupid inanimate object or the rude driver, the annoying guy at work, in between that and my anger is my interpretation of it, my perception of it, my thoughts about it. So after further review, I make me mad. And just to make sure we all get this, Would you just say these words out loud together? Let's just say this together. I make me so mad. Let's say that with conviction. I make me so mad. So this week, so this week when you're getting frustrated in traffic, 
or you're about to kind of lose it at home with somebody or somebody at work, when you're ready to like unleash a little unnecessary roughness on somebody, you are going to stick your index finger out and you're going to point it at yourself and you're going to say, I make me so mad. Just a reminder from James chapter 1, my dear brothers and sisters, just be quick to listen. Be slow to speak and slow to get angry because your anger can never make things right. Your anger can never make things right in God's sight. And that's why the Holy Spirit wants to put the router to our rage and take the edge off of you and me. There's this third step in this process where the Holy Spirit really wants to get deep. And he wants to sand out any underlying bitterness. As far as I'm concerned, the best part of football season is tailgating. I mean, it's just a blast. You show up somewhere and they got grills all over the place and you can smell burgers and and brats and hot dogs and stuff and i'm sure even this summer some of you did some picnics where you had you know watermelon and potato salad and all that kind of stuff or maybe you spent some time at the little league park this summer and you had snow cones and pixie sticks and if, if you got a bunch of preschoolers on these trips with you you know what you pack right those little juicy squeeze it things you know, the little Capri Sun thing. You know what I'm talking about? The little squeezes. Whatever you, whatever's inside, when you squeeze it, it squirts out. Did you know that you and me are like squeeze That whatever is on the inside of us, when we get a little pressure applied, it squirts out. And if we got love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all those things inside of us, when we get squeezed, it comes out. But if we got like unresolved tension and bitterness inside of us, guess what? That's going to come out. And honestly, that's why some of us get flagged for unnecessary roughness so often. Because we get so filled up with stress and hurt and past memories and overloaded schedules and disappointment and insecurity. That's what's in us. And we're so full of that stuff that anytime anyone or anything slightly jostles us, it just squirts out. And people around us get hurt. You see, you see, bitterness is the antithesis of gentleness because it's power out of control. And it will suck the joy out of your life and will cause you to judge other people and criticize other people and make you walk around with a huge you owe me kind of chip on your shoulder and a grudge deeply embedded in your heart. And I am learning that you cannot be filled with the Holy Spirit and filled with resentment at the same time. It doesn't work that way. He does not flourish in that environment. So what he wants to do, he wants to move in and sand out that bitter poison. Instead of holding on to grudges and hurts and entitlement, he will take you to verses like this, like like Ephesians chapter 4. He'll just remind you in the moment, through the day, if you you put this in your heart, he'll say, come on, just be humble and gentle. Just be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, make an allowance for each other's fault because of your love. He'll take you to passages like Colossians chapter 3, where it says, you know, you don't have an option. You must make allowances for each other's faults. And you must forgive the person who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And though the one who forgave us, the Lord, he, he said, Jesus one time, he said, you've heard it said, love your neighbors. I tell you, love your enemies. And even pray for those who persecute you. That former tough guy, Paul, he wrote these words in Romans chapter 12. He said, just bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. I mean, right now, if you're honest, after further review, maybe the reason right now that you're a bit harsh with people, the reason you're a little irritable or a little angry, maybe the reason you honestly are dishing out some unnecessary roughness on yourself and on other people, because you got so much unresolved bitterness in your soul. You're all messed up over somebody in your life who disappointed you, hurt you, used you, abused you, and it's eaten you alive. And so the Holy Spirit might be saying to you today, come on, let me go to work in you. I want to sand out that bitterness. Let's start working on forgiving and things like that. And let's just replace this bitterness with gentleness. After we allow God's Spirit to plane our disposition and router our rage and sand out our bitterness like any project you're proud of, you know what God wants to do? He wants to apply this soft glow finish Not a glossy finish, just a soft glow finish called gentleness. And then he wants to put us on display. He wants to put us on display. He wants to show the world what he can do with reclaimed lumber from the junkyard like us. And when people see our lives, the changes he's made in us, it inspires people. It gives them hope. Did you know that Jesus is still an awesome carpenter? 
HGTV's got nothing on Jesus. In fact, Jesus has built more fine homes in the Santa Clarita Valley than all the other builders combined. And he really specializes in remodeling. He loves like flipping lives. He just loves that. Even ones that are absolutely falling apart. And now you know what he wants to do? He wants to have an open house and show everybody just what he is capable of doing. Well, I mean, we just read, let your gentleness be evident to all. We are on display. He produces that gentleness in us. He says, now I want it to be evident to everybody. Everybody you come in contact with, you are on display. You're on display with the sales associate at the mall. You are on display, you know, with that person behind the 7-Eleven counter. We are on display in the stands of a high school soccer game. We are on display in the parking lot of real life. You're on display with the waiter or waitress at the local restaurant. You know, I've often thought how sad it is that restaurant workers dread. I mean, I've talked to a bunch of them. They dread the just got out of church crowd. I mean, I've talked to enough. They'll tell you, a lot of people who walk in straight out of church are grouchy, demanding, whiny, rude, impatient complainers who tip very little. And that is embarrassing to God. It ought to be the exact opposite. That's why my prayer has always been that because of people like you, because of churches like Real Life, that the restaurant workers of this area would be jumping up and down going, oh man, church is almost over. I can't wait for those Real Life people to walk in here. They are the best, man. They are fun and kind and patient and gentle. They don't gripe and they leave enormous tips. I just love working weekends. We're on display. Let your gentleness be evident to all. You see, God is this incredible craftsman who just loves to take raw material. I'm talking rude, obnoxious, formerly self-centered people like us, and he draws us back into a relationship with himself through Jesus Christ, and then he puts his Holy Spirit in us, who puts us on the shop table and planes and chisels and routes and sands and smooths out all of our rough edges and applies the finishing soft glow touch of gentleness so that he can put us on display so the world will see what a great God he is, what he's capable of doing in anybody's life. So today, if you might be sensing, I think you're talking to me today. Maybe you're sensing that God's throwing a flag on you for unnecessary roughness like he did on my life. You know what you need to do? Agree with him. Because he's always right. He never makes the wrong call. So why don't you just humbly say right now, God, you know what? After further review, you're right. I need a dose of gentleness in my life. You might even go as far to to do what several guys told me in the last service. Because God said, I'm going home. I'm putting a nail over the door. You might need to do something like that. There's something that will remind you on a daily basis. Man, just be gentle. That's the way Jesus was. So why don't we just bow our heads. Let's just, let's just pray for a minute about this. Uh, God, we need our power under your control so much. We all got rough edges. We all, we all need help in this area. And Lord, we know it's, the great, great news is it's not up to us to make this change. It's up to us to cooperate with your Holy Spirit and Let him change us. And we really want to do that. I guess, Jesus, what what I really want to say is we want to be like you. When you were passionate, you were driven, you were so purposeful, but the way you related to people, the, the tone you used and the compassion you had, and we want to be gentle like that. We want our power to be under your control. God, I can't help but think what a change would happen in our homes and our workplaces and our neighborhoods and our schools if we would just be gentler people. So, Father, I I pray that whatever we need to do to allow your Holy Spirit to to pull off what what he wants to pull off in us, that we would do that we would start living in the awareness of his presence in our life, that we would ask you throughout the day to remind us when we're kind of crossing a line, because we do want to become like that list that you showed us. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Jesus, for the great example of what it means 
uh, to be a truly gentle person. We love you, and we're grateful for your example, and I pray all this in your name. Amen. Well, next weekend, uh, we're going to talk about the most often called penalty in football. And honestly, it's been the most often called penalty in my own life, and I'm guessing yours too. And I really believe that if we could like start to possess some gentleness and what we're going to talk about next week, it could be a game changer for your life and your relationships. So don't miss next week. Bring a friend back with you. Until then, you guys have a great week. We'll see you back next weekend.